morning, good afternoon, good evening to you all. Uh, I am looking forward to telling you more about high performance and super elastic polyurethanes and how it was achieved through uh, 3D and even 4D printing. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Park Systems for the opportunity uh, to give this webinar series to you. And uh, as Gerald uh, has introduced, um, and also uh, since we are uh, looking at this series, um, I'd be happy to correspond with you by email, which is given uh, in this uh, first slide, uh, if you have any uh, further questions. So I'm a professor at Case Western Reserve University. We are a major comprehensive research university in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, this is actually how it looks like these days because of our summer months, a beautiful summer. Uh, and in uh, the university, we are near uh, uh, Cleveland uh, Museum of Art, uh, Cleveland Orchestra, Cleveland Clinic. So just a cultural center uh, in Cleveland, Ohio. Okay, so we have art, orchestra, and think box. So think box is one of the first maker space uh, facilities in any university in the United States. Uh, we have been generously, generously funded by uh, donors and uh, some private and federal grants. Uh, this facility is open. Uh, meaning uh, not only students, faculty, but also people from the outside can avail of our 3D printing, prototyping facilities, subtractive manufacturing, and fab design lab. Okay, and you can access this uh, more or more information through the web. I'm a professor at Macromolecular Science Engineering. And we are located at the Kent Hale Smith building. My office is at the fifth floor. Uh, most of the work that I'm presenting, actually, I would like to acknowledge Charlie Chen, a talented PhD student uh, who did most of the, this work, actually, with the polyurethane projects. Uh, my research group, we do a lot of nanomaterials, nanostructured interfaces, chemistry of interfaces. Uh, I am a chemist by training, and we would like to do a lot of things uh, in terms of uh, nanostructuring and interfacial modification. But today, I'm going to focus uh, our talk on 3D printing and polyurethanes uh, specifically. Back in 2016, I gave this talk at the World Economic Forum in Dubai, uh, outlining some of the uh, perspective and future uses of 3D printing in uh, aerospace, automotive, outer space, biomedical engineering, bioinspired design, and so on. Let me tell you more about polymers. And, and so 3D printing actually makes use of polymers, ceramics, steel, uh, and other uh, materials, uh, including food ingredients for 3D printing. However, today we're going to focus in general on polymer materials. As you can see here, the hierarchy of polymers that are 3D printed, printed starts from commodity polymers, such that you're familiar with PLA, ABS, other types of polyolefins uh, for 3D printing. However, we can classify nylon, polyesters, polycarbonates as more engineering related polymers, including polyurethanes. Uh, and, and the higher performance polymers will include PIC, PIEC, PPS, and uh, they're gaining traction in terms of uh, 3D printability. So all in all, we can say that polymers are a majority of materials that are 3D printed today. Uh, when it comes to choices, it is a combination of cost and performance. So in an Ashby-like diagram here where we have the cost and the performance, we can basically differentiate two types of materials, a resin based on thermoplastic, such as uh, uh, peak or polyolefins or polyesters, polycarbonate. On the other hand, Thermoset resins could include epoxy, cyanide, esters, polyimides, and of course, polyurethane. Uh, we are actually going to focus more on polyurethane 
thermoplastics rather than thermosets today. And here is a collage showing the possibilities and applications of uh, 3D printing. So as you can see here, many industries will rely on very good materials, high performance materials that can be used not only for prototyping, but also for parts replacement. That's why uh, we have a lot of interest on developing new materials for 3D printing. Uh, we actually do this not only with using the polymer itself, but we combine nanomaterials such as graphene, nanoclay, metal, metal oxide, uh, cellulose nanofibers in order to improve the properties of these materials. And I will show you today uh, this approach we took together with polyurethane to differentiate them from a typical polyurethane composition. And why not nanocomposites? Well, as shown here, for example, just with graphene, graphene, uh, when incorporated in plastics uh, such as PMMA or even polystyrene, when properly nanostructured, can improve the thermomechanical properties of polymers by extending their modulus, uh, elongation at break, and so on, as shown here. And this has been very well known uh, for a long time uh, with bulk uh, materials or bulk process uh, uh, polymers uh, based, let's say, on molding or extrusion methods. Uh, nanoclay is also an important uh, additive. Nanoclay uh, used in nylon, polyesters, uh, polyolefins, uh, when exfoliated or layered, have advantages not only on thermomechanical properties uh, by improving the modulus, but also on barrier materials or preventing diffusion of gases. So overall, uh, nanocomposites and polyurethane will be a potent combination, as I'll show you. However, we do other types of 3D printing materials in our group, including the use of acrylates, the use of silicone uh, combinations with PLA and polyether, ether ketone, uh, and so on. And we use a variety of 3D printing methods from FDM, uh, fuse deposition modeling, to VSP, which is viscous solution printing through SLA, uh, stereolithographic apparatus. And some of our recent papers are outlined here and corresponding uh, with uh, any of the audience, I'll be happy to share more or point to you uh, to our group website. So today, let us focus on polyurethane. In particular, we will be talking about polyurethane elastomers. We are not going to have time to talk about polyurethane foams, polyurethane thermosets, or what I consider cousins of polyurethane, including polyurea, polyaspartic acid, and so on. Uh, that type of chemistry can be reserved for another day, except to point that polyurethane, an additive chemistry or additive polymerization, is one of the most important commercially available polymers today, uh, without mentioning some of the big commercial suppliers in detail. Uh, of course, we can think about uh, Bayer, Covestro, BASF, uh, other uh, companies like Dow and other smaller companies, of course, produce polyurethane uh, competitively in pricing. Polyurethane, as you can see here, can be used in sportswear, shoes, seals, sealants, uh, thermoplastic and engineering materials. Uh, as thermosets and foams, actually you're more familiar with bedding, uh, when you sleep well at, at night, you can thank uh, polyurethanes because they make excellent bedding material or cushion or even in automotive applications. Uh, polyurethane can be uh, derived from many types of sources, including petroleum-based and bio-based feedstock. So overall, polyurethane plays a very important uh, um, role in our daily life. It's a polymer of everyday thing. And the reason we call this polyurethane is because of the urethane linkage as shown here, 
that is formed. I'm going to explain to you how the urethane unit is formed, uh, whereas you can add amines or you can uh, have the presence of CO2, and then that changes to other types of casins, quote unquote, of polyurethane, including polyurea, uh, polyaspartic acid, derivatives, or even combinations with epoxy in some chemistries. So what's a polyurethane? Well, the simplest that you can think of is when you have a diol and a diisocyanate, when they react, they form a urethane linkage. The urethane linkage is shown here. There are other ways to form that urethane linkage with, without going through the diol or diisocyanate route. In fact, these days, there's a lot of interest on non diisocyanate polyurethanes, meaning uh, the industry uh, is also looking at doing away with the diisocyanate chemistry to form polyurethanes. But still, this is a very important reaction uh, for a lot of applications, including thermosets, thermoplastics, thermoplastic elastomers, because the reaction does not result in the formation of a byproduct, meaning equilibrium wise, it does not depend uh, on the outgassing or removal of uh, a low molecular weight unit uh, such as uh, polyesters or polyamides. It is what we call one of those additive polymerization, meaning you polymerize them and you get the polymer without any byproducts. Now what differentiates polyurethane in other types of applications, including thermoplastics, is that this is one of the polymers that can be converted into a thermoplastic elastomer. The thermoplastic elastomer is a function of the presence of hard and soft segments. And I'm going to discuss that in a little detail. The uh, label MDI, and you'll see the meaning of this acronym, is basically a diisocyanate source that gives it a hard segment uh, type of interaction. On the other hand, a polyol based on an ethylene glycol or a polytetramethylene ether gives it the soft segment. Uh, in a way, you can also differentiate this as a more crystalline versus an amorphous uh, segment uh, that, or rather, interaction that results in their thermoplastic behavior due to the phase separation of these groups as well. The result is you have a polyurethane that acts uh, more like an elastomer. <clears throat> so more about the uh, units. <clears throat> MDI stands for diphenylmethane diisocyanate uh, and toluene diisocyanate TDI. These are some of the more common diisocyanate sources. Now, the diisocyanate can react with the uh, polyols, a diol, or a diamine, as shown here. The hard segment then constitutes that of the crystalline. Uh, phenyl ring containing MDI, let us say, and then the soft segment will be various molecular weights of the polyol. Uh, the polyols uh, are low molecular weight or high molecular weight, but in general they have a melting point below room temperature. So they provide what we call the soft segment in, because they are actually liquids at room temperature. So when these two react, you end up with a polyurethane linkage that constitutes your poly <coughs> polymer. Now, probably as some of you uh, may be familiar with uh, uh, spandex and estane and other types of commercial polymers, uh, these type of polyurethanes, as you can see here, are actually related to polyurea. Uh, uh, the, the term polyurethane uh, can be comprised of segments containing polyurea and even urethane linkages. 
So again, without going through this chemistry and the variability in chemical structures, you can see normally these excellent properties makes them very good materials for sportswear, for rubber shears, for anything that has very good durability and stretchability at the same time. And again, probably some of you are more familiar with the term spandex or commercial name spandex. Now, polyurethane, of course, has other uses in specifically with the biomedical field. So a typical uh, arrangement, again, would involve varying the polyol content uh, using a chain extender, which will be alkyl in nature, and then, of course, the corresponding diisocyanate. The way you stitch them together uh, results in variable lengths of the amorphous or a soft block and variable lengths of the hard block. So by judiciously uh, or rationally changing this hard and soft segment, or hard and soft block, then you can achieve variable thermomechanical strength. Now, one of the interesting uses of polyurethane, of course, is in the biomedical uh, industry, okay? Um, again, here's a picture of what we mean by hard and soft segments. The rigid segments crystallize very well due to, let's say, hydrogen bonding, and the soft segments, which are actually, uh, uh, have melting points below room temperature are more are more close at room temperature. So, what are some of the other applications? Well, I mentioned about biomedical applications of TPU, and here you can see uh, some um, biomedical devices, uh, including uses in the artificial heart or in uh, membranes or different types of. Uh, uh, compositions and stent catheters, uh, implants, or even uh, dialysis equipment. So overall, uh, biomedical applications of TPU is also important consideration and why we want to 3D print them. So now let us turn to 3D printing and how can we 3D print uh, polyurethanes. Let us first look at the 3D printing of TPU with a nanocomposite with graphene oxide based on FDM. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that graphene oxide is an important material for nanocomposite studies. What we have done is actually look at graphene oxide that can be blended with uh, TPU. Um, and the way we did this is we actually had to compatibilize with PLA. The mixture was done in solution rather than direct melt blending because we get a more efficient control on the mixing ratio and better mixing properties by doing this route. After mixing them in solvent, let's say dichloromethane or DMF, we then precipitate this material in ethanol and then dry them overnight. And then after drying, we then finally use them for filament extrusion by melt. And then finally, the filament is available for 3D printing. Uh, we use techniques like FTIR to confirm the mixing of TPU and graphene oxide, which changes the frequencies associated at 720, 1727 and 726, uh, which can be attributed to the presence of double bonds, isolated double bonds, as well changes based on the amount of graphene as well as the uh, 1727 uh, carbonyl stretch. But more importantly for graphene oxide, this can be monitored by Raman spectroscopy. As you can see here, by loading the graphene oxide, we observe what we call the D and G bonds, the disorder and graphitic bonds associated with graphene oxide. And of course, adding more graphene oxide increases the presence of these D and G bands by Raman spectroscopy. So here we have it. After uh, making the filament, we then use uh, uh, fuse deposition modeling uh, to prepare these samples. As you can see here, uh, the PLA at a TPU mixture was fixed at 7-3 ratio. And then we add a different percentage of graphene oxide. Now, the uh, uh, TPU uh, without the uh, PLA and graphene oxide is actually printable, as shown here. 
but after adding graphene oxide, the material turns black. And as you can see here, we have a black material, but still is stretch, uh, elastomeric or flexible uh, since we retain the TPU elastomeric property. And here are some examples of the uh, materials that we printed, uh, the ability to um, flex them and recover their shape. Okay, so to test this uh, polyurethane, we did two types of tests, compression and modulus testing. So compression modulus uh, uh, and tensile modulus was done on two types of sample. The compression modulus was done by printing this um, a cube. Um, um, we distinguish two types of orientation, uh, the height, and the width and the length. Um, uh, so this uh, um, object uh, can be differentiated into two types of positions based on the S direction, standing specimen with respect to the printing orientation or the lying down specimen, uh, uh, which is uh, orthogonal to the printing uh, direction or lying down on the build plate. Okay, so with these two orientation, what we are interested in is monitoring the changes in their properties with orientation. Well, first of all, what does graphene oxide do? Graphene oxide, do, uh, as in, in general as shown here, improves the um, compression modulus regardless whether it's in the L or an S uh, orientation. So in other words, graphene oxide already does its job simply by adding it to the filament. As we increase the amount of graphene oxide, you can see here the corresponding almost linear increase in the L and the S compression direction. Uh, and when you look at the aqua compression experiment, or when we were trying to determine the bulk modulus properties as well, we can see two different types of behavior as shown here uh, based on the stress and strain curve. In general, we were able to increase the uh, compression modulus for the L specimen at 56%. However, we get greater increase in compression modulus with the uh, S direction, okay? And, and that means uh, uh, standing uh, or, or, or um, follows the printing direction, okay? Uh, on the other hand, uh, we can look at the tensile modulus results. The tensile modulus result is quite interesting. Without the graphene oxide, uh, we have the corresponding value about 45 megapascals. However, when we uh, added 0.5 weight percent graphene oxide, we almost doubled the tensile modulus to 80. However, adding uh, uh, 2 weight percent five and 5 weight percent graphene oxide did not move the property so much. Uh, we surmise that this has to do with the poor mixing or perhaps even at 2 and 5 weight percent, it is very hard to optimize the homogeneous dispersion and orientation of the graphene oxide. The bottom line here is adding more graphene oxide does not necessarily increase the bulk modulus. If you suspect any type of aggregation or poor nanostructuring on the part of the filler material. However, cost-wise, it says there that as little as 0.5 weight percent graphene oxide loading already increases the tensile modulus up to 75%. We observed that this type of changes affects the crystalline behavior and the degradation based on PGA and TSC testing as shown in this curve. Thus, the thermal stability can be significantly improved uh, by the simple addition of about 0.5 weight percent of the graphene oxide. Now, to do some uh, uh, post uh, printing analysis, it's clear here that uh, failure can be attributed to several things. One is during printing, as you can see here, there's a lot of void spaces present. And this is very common with 3D printing because it's a layering um, um, addition of actual fibers that are extruded uh, in the melt. Uh, a lot of void space or simply moisture that is trapped, that is formed on the material. And this is 
a source of failure on 3D printing compared to uh, extruded or bulk process uh, uh, polyurethane or, or other materials. Okay. Uh, by SEM, uh, we also try to observe uh, the surface, uh, what uh, aggregation of graphene oxide uh, would look like and the loading as well as its influence in roughness. What you can see here essentially is the increase in roughness is associated with the strong interaction of the graphene oxide uh, with the material. And then finally, uh, the thermal stability test as verified here, uh, which I showed earlier. In general, graphene oxide increases the thermal stability of the polyurethane uh, as shown here, and also changes the melting point uh, to a higher melting point. Now, I mentioned that this TPU is important for biomedical applications. So this particular TPU PLA combination with GEO actually has very good cell viability as shown by the uh, cell culture here of NIH 3T3 cells on all compositions we have. In other words, 3D printing does not alter the biomedical uh, grade or applications of these materials, even with the presence of graphene oxide. Okay, so from here, let me turn to another 3D printing project with polyurethane, this time involving the use of uh, nanocomposite material together with nanoclay, resulting actually in an elastomeric foam. A non-unconventional route towards polyurethane, starting with the polymer or thermoplastic polymer and then ending up with the polyurethane. So how did we do it? First, let us talk about foams. <coughs> foams are important for lightweighting, uh, enhanced mechanical performance, uh, you know, for beds, for seat cushions, cover, for other types of packaging application. Uh, they're lightweight because of the volume of air uh, present either in open or closed cell form, form meaning uh, you can uh, have a more rigid or a more elastomeric foam, and of course the large surface area, which actually makes them useful for other types of diffusion and transport applications, including membranes. So there's a desire for lightweight material, high surface area, including uh, uses for packaging, seating, and tissue engineering scaffolds. What is our objective here? Well, we want to use 3D printing in a unique form. Can we make 3D printed objects initially having a plastic property, but then by treatment uh, using, let's say, uh, etching or dissolution, end up with a foam? Uh, usually, polyurethane foams are made by essentially a cross-linking reaction uh, with the resulting formation, let's say, of carbon dioxide that results in that um, bubble or, or porous formation. However, the use of thermoplastic polyurethane, as we will demonstrate here, requires the actual design of a void space based on a grid pattern. So the way we utilize this is different from FDM. We utilize a technique called viscous solution printing. And sometimes this is known as direct ink writing printing, uh, which involves uh, the use of a essentially a paste extruder or a syringe, which is then uh, used to limit the size of the extruded material uh, through the uh, injection or a pump. Uh, you know, one way for me to describe this is, this is how you would 3D print ketchup or chocolate, okay? The material has to be texotropic, meaning as you press it, it flows, and as soon as you remove the pressure or force, it uh, stands alone or does not flow. In other words, it's deformable only upon the application of external stress. And uh, we have found that the material has to have shear thinning viscosity. Um, it has to have a sufficient yield stress, typically higher than 200 pascals, and sufficient storage modulus. Um, G prime, as rheologically measured, uh, greater than 1,000 pascals. 
Uh, so, so this can be done uh, through syringe, but then there are other types of printing heads or mixing heads that allow you to, let's say, 3D print a gel, 3D print a paste, silicone or epoxy, deposit it uh, in a CNC type of movement and end up with an object. So rheologically, there's a lot of things one need to pay attention, including the flow rate, the pressure apply the width, the uh, distance between the substrate. Uh, the viscosity measurement actually is a standard uh, uh, measurement we do for this viscous type of materials before 3D printing. Okay, so for example, before we go to poly polyurethane, this is actually some of the parameters we use to 3D print silicones. So silicone uh, elastomers based on a curing or thermoset elastomeric curing a system to produce rubber allows us to 3D print these commercial silicones with a quite high resolution, as you can see here, up to 100 microns. And here is another high resolution 3D printing we did uh, with a uh, Ultimaker 3 structured 3D attachment. Here's another picture of silicone 3D printed to make a silicone tennis ball, okay? So what did we do the TPU differently? Well, we prepared a viscous space of TPU. We mix nanoclay, and I'll explain to you what the use of nanoclay is. And this was done with DMF and DM, DCM, or dimethyl uh, formamide and dichloromethane as a solvent, to come up with a paste, a rheologically modified paste of uh, polyurethane, which has these properties in terms of the uh, uh, moduli and viscosity uh, or your, the measurement of G prime and G double prime uh, with various ratios of clay uh, as shown here. So they all fall within the requirements we have for shear thinning, yield stress, and storage modulus. Uh, just to show you how printable this polyurethane is, you can watch this movie. So this shows you uh, the type of objects, the resolution, and essentially the paste uh, of uh, thermoplastic polyurethane that comes out from the nozzle and how we have tried to optimize this process in a variety of uh, rheological conditions and compositions. Okay, So the result is we make objects like this. We can make a grid pattern, we can make this uh, bat object, uh, etc. So let me tell you how this ends up to be a foam. So starting with the thermoplastic polyurethane and using 3D printing as a design tool, we are able to make these grids of various openings, okay? Or various uh, opening ranging from one to 0.5 millimeter. And this is important because uh, we want to simulate a uh, possible uh, um, analogy with the foam material of various porous porosities. However, we did something different. We tried to control the micro scale to nanoscale roughness by removing the nanoclay that we inco actually incorporated in the material. The nanoclay can be removed by hydrofluoric acid etching such that we have this grid material, but at the same time we have a, we can convert this to a porous material simply by removing the uh, uh, nanoclay and thus end up with porous uh, porosity within this uh, 3D printed material at the micros. And this is how it looks like. So after doing that hydrofluoric acid treatment at various ratios and various sizes, as you can see here, the material somewhat swells, but then you can see the porosity by scanning electron microscopy present on these materials because of the removal of nanoclay. And the type of sizes of the nanoclay has to do with the concentration of the nanoclay incorporated. The more nanoclay incorporated, the bigger the size of the opening uh, or increased porosity in general. So we can correlate this compression modulus. So we basically took the material and then compressed them and then measured the modulus. 
showing that by increasing the um, a nano clay uh, component, we can increase the compression uh, modulus uh, by in changing the size of the opening using 3D printing CAD design. We can change the density. Uh, and then here you can see the compression modulus as a function of uh, composition and opening size changing on basically uh, three samples with uh, at least the possibility of nine combinations. Right, so let's look at some 3D printed material and movies. So as we originally print one combination of the TPU with the original nanoclay still present, you can see here that it's not easily deformable, okay? When we press it, it doesn't compress. With a larger opening, you can already see that the thermoplastic polyurethane is giving way and that the density and the uh, porosity achieved uh, was done by the CAD design or the 3D printing design. Once we remove the uh, nanoclay using hydrochloric acid etching, look what happens to the compressibility. So essentially the plastic becomes a foam. And here you can see another combination or a different composition and opening as well. So, so we are able to achieve different types of properties depending on the combination of size and nanoclay. So we can achieve 80% compression strain up to 10 cycles and we can prolong this up to a thousand cycles. Uh, this type of deformation is not easily observed in typical uh, foam materials as well based on this route. And so we actually call this type of behavior super elastic but mechanically robust. And as you can see here, we can go all the way to a thousand compression cycles with about 60% compression strain change. A more practical application, for example, we can coat this with carbon nanotube and we can use this as a thermoplastic elastomeric switch to turn on and off the diode, as you can see here. So this type of on and off uh, capability conducting uh, elastomeric foam was demonstrated here. Okay, so with this, I'm about to uh, conclude. Uh, I have shown you pathways by which we can use polyurethane for 3D printing or even 4D printing and that polyurethane as an important material will be and should be the subject of many more studies to come uh, with regards to improving their thermomechanical properties, biocompatibility and conversion to other interesting materials. So with that, uh, I'd like to conclude and I'll be happy to answer any questions and turn this over to Gerald.